Welcome back to the Sociology of Law. This week we're going to be discussing the topic of criminal law. Now the American legal system is usually divided into two systems. There's our system of criminal law, which tends to be more penal in style, and there's our system of civil law, which tends to be more compensatory. And we're going to start by considering criminal law, then we'll move on to civil law later. And our first topic under criminal law is policing. Like many aspects of the American legal system, the history of American policing goes back to roots in England. And if we trace the history of the police in England back, we find that in the Middle Ages, in the early medieval period, there were no police. So there's a time before police were a thing. And in this early medieval period, without any full-time officials charged with enforcing the law, people had to handle the law themselves. They had to rely on self-help. They had to take the law into their own hands and be able to defend themselves by force from theft and assault. And so you had members of communities and family members banding together to catch thieves and deter violence and punish wrongdoers. But the whole thing really changes after the year 1066. In the year 1066, a Norman Frenchman named William the Bastard invades England and conquers it and gets his name upgraded to William the Conqueror. And under William the Conqueror, you have something called the Frank Pledge System. In the Frank Pledge system, at the base of it was organizing people from communities into groups of 10 men. So you'd get like 10 men from the same community and put them in a group of 10 and call them a tithing. And the tithing was basically a unit of collective responsibility. Each man in the group was responsible for each other man's conduct. So if one of those 10 men committed a crime, it was the responsibility of the other nine to see he was brought to justice or they would get in trouble as well as him. Overseeing these tithings were officials called constables. For every 10 tithings, you had a constable who was in charge of regulating them all. And these constables over time evolved into the main legal official who kept order in the urban areas, the towns and the cities where people were concentrated. And for every 100 tithings, you had an official called a reeve, a shire reeve. And this eventually evolved into our word sheriff. And the sheriff evolved into the main legal official charged with overseeing things at the level of the county. And so they became the main law enforcement in rural areas, charged with things like collecting taxes and hunting down bandits. In the American colonies, at first, there wasn't a whole lot of law. And to understand why, if think of this in terms of the theory of law we covered in our last couple sections. Law varies directly with relational and cultural distance, and the first colonies didn't have much of either. They tended to be very intimate, small-scale societies, and they tended to be very culturally homogenous. So most of the conflicts that erupted within the colonies were conflicts that crossed very small social distances, conflicts unlikely to require the intervention of the law. But as the colonies grew rapidly, you had more and more strangers interacting, you had more and more people from diverse backgrounds interacting, and you had a greater demand for law and for policing. And the mix of law enforcement you got in early America looked a lot like the same system that evolved in England. In the towns and urban areas, you had constables, and the constables were often appointed positions, but it wasn't a position anybody wanted. Constables didn't get a salary. They got some fees they could collect for certain services. Imagine like having to call the cops and, you know, you have to pay a fee to get the cop to take away the thief who you caught. But they could also be fined if they screwed up at their job. And generally, it was considered a low-status position. It was something that was dangerous and thankless and didn't come with much pay. And of course, nobody is being trained and equipped properly for this. So it was a job that better off sorts of people avoided if they could, and they'd pull strings to not be the constable. The same thing goes for being a night watchman. The job of the night watchman, as the term implies, was to keep watch at night. They kept watch for attacks from, say, Indian tribes or for people up to no good within the colony at night, or for fire, which was a major hazard at that time, before modern fire departments. And this was, in many of the colonies, something like a duty every person was supposed to do. Like, everybody had to take a turn on the night's watch. It was like a rotating draft. Only, if you were wealthy, you could pay someone else to take your turn for you, which most wealthy people preferred to do. Why have something that costs you a good night's sleep and distracts you from your day job? So again, it wound up being a low-status position, very thankless, and you had these untrained people with very little incentive to do their job correctly. As in England, you had, at the county level, sheriffs, and they were one of the main forms of law enforcement in rural areas. But you also had in the South slave patrols because a large chunk of the population of the South were slaves and the elites had a strong interest in catching runaways and preventing rebellions. And so you had these slave patrols, which would have been groups of 5, 10, 15 men organized into a kind of militia almost that would patrol the rural areas in the slave South and try to keep order and keep the slaves under control. An actual professional police force of full-time specialists who were trained and equipped and South 
salaried, that's a recent historical innovation. And it began in London in 1829 with a reformer named Robert Peel, who created the London Police Department, the world's first professional police department. And the reason policing came on the scene in the 1800s is because the population was growing so rapidly and urbanizing so rapidly, the cities were growing and they were becoming chaotic. Riots were happening very frequently, and the cities were very violent places at this time, and there's a lot of public disorder. But people were very resistant to the idea of police, especially in England. I mean, the English had always prided themselves on being a people who had a lot of liberty, and they would contrast their own legal system with the inquisitorial system over in continental Europe and say, look, our system guarantees freedoms and rights a lot better. They were very proud of that. This is also a country that had recently had a bloody civil war in which people had felt military occupation, uniformed full-time law enforcement enforcers seemed a little bit too much like soldiers to them. So people were very hostile to the idea, and so a big part of Robert Peel's philosophy of policing was to make the police as not militaristic as possible. So at the time, British soldiers wore red uniforms, so what color did the police wear? They wore blue, to make them look very opposite of soldiers. He still had them wear uniforms because he wanted them to be clearly identified as law officers, so people could find them and depend on them, and they couldn't shirk their duty. And there was this emphasis on accountability. The great innovation was badges with officer numbers on the badge so you could, you know, record the officer's name and number and complain about them if they weren't doing their job right. So here you have your first force of uniformed, trained, and equipped full-time professional police charged with keeping order and patrolling the city to prevent crime. And within, you know, about 15, 20 years, you had this model being copied in the U.S. So America's first police department was founded in 1845 in New York City, and from there they spread all around the country. And over the next hundred years, you would see the police continue to evolve, often in waves where there were concerns with corruption or further professionalization of the ranks. And you also saw the evolution of the police as new technologies were invented and incorporated into policing. Troll cars, telephones, things like that have had a huge impact on policing. Given that they're the main point of interface between your average citizen and the criminal legal system, it's no surprise that policing is often a source of controversy. One of the most common controversies that you hear talked about is controversies over racial discrimination in policing and the question of whether police often use inappropriate force against black suspects. And in U.S. history, this concern has led to race riots. So in the late 1960s, you had a string of riots across American cities, and these riots were in black urban centers, and they were almost always sparked by some sort of police-citizen conflict. I'm just old enough to remember not one of the 1960s riots, but the one we had in 1992 in Los Angeles. A black motorist named Rodney King had been speeding down the highway and had refused to pull over for officers, and so when he finally did pull over and wouldn't obey their orders, they beat the heck out of him. And there was some famous video footage that a bystander captured of, you see five, six, seven officers standing around Rodney King, and he's crawling along the ground on all fours, and they're beating him with batons and tasering him and stomping him, and this became a national scandal on television. And when the officers were later acquitted of using excessive force at their trial, it led to the 1992 LA riots, where for three days, a large chunk of South Central Los Angeles burned, and people's stores were looted, and businesses were burned, and some, in some cases, white motorists were pulled from their cars and beaten half to death in anger over that verdict. So controversies about race and policing continue to this day. Another controversy from the modern age is the idea that the police are becoming increasingly militarized. We've seen the Department of Homeland Security give surplus military equipment to a lot of police departments around the country, and so now you have you know, small town police departments with armored personnel carriers, and you'll see officers wearing military camouflage instead of the traditional blue or black uniforms. And this runs against the ideology upon which the modern police were founded, that they look very different and act very different from a military force so that people don't see themselves as being occupied by a military but see a public servant. You've also seen a controversy over various municipal governments and police departments around the U.S. increasingly funding their activities by seizing property from citizens. You, know, you might have a town government that a large chunk of its revenue stream comes from fining people, and so the town government then puts pressure on the police department to fine as many people as possible. And so you get this economic incentive for making up reasons to give people tickets and fines that you would not have given them otherwise other than you want their money. And so you have this idea that law could become a kind of predation rather than a way of enforcing justice. You also have a phenomenon called civil asset forfeiture, which is the idea that police can seize your property property if that property is the result of criminal activities. And the idea was like if you find a drug dealer and he has a big suitcase full of cash from uh, selling drugs, the police can then claim that suitcase full of cash and use it to fund their department so dirty money is going to a good use. But of course, 
this presents the problem that police can seize someone's money on suspicion that it's connected to wrongdoing, and then the person has to prove their innocence to get their money back. And this can be a very long and costly process. And this runs against the ideas from liberal jurisprudence of due process that you don't take someone's life and liberty and property without due process of the law to show that they're actually guilty of something. You don't just seize their property on suspicion. And if you're allowed to just take property on suspicion, then it provides an incentive to just become extra suspicious of everybody and to start seizing property left, right, and center. And so you've seen some controversial cases of people who've lost a lot of their stuff through civil asset forfeiture and had to fight to try to get it back. And you've seen lawsuits and cases that went to the Supreme Court, which recently has put new limits on this practice. So in previous weeks, we've covered this theory of law that explains how social aspects of a case affect the way the case is handled. And so in Black's article, Varieties of Police Work, he's applying this theory of law to the policing literature. And so in this article, he talks about different varieties of police work and how each of these varies with the social conditions of the case and how it illustrates aspects of this theory of law. Now, all these varieties of police work you can divide up into two major types. There's reactive policing and proactive policing. Reactive policing is when police are mobilized by citizen complaints. So they're responding to citizens drawing them into the situation by calling the police. Proactive policing is when police act on their own accord. They're not being mobilized by any citizen complaints, but are taking it in their own hands to go out and find some crime to punish. The whole idea behind police patrol going back to the founding of the first police departments was that patrol was supposed to be proactive. Police would patrol a community and look for wrongdoing and by their very presence prevent wrongdoing from happening. The idea was crime prevention, really. But modern police patrol, thanks to the automobile and 911, is mostly reactive. Patrol officers sit in their cars and wait to get calls from a central dispatcher, usually responding to a phone call from a citizen. Note that there's very little variation in how police are dispatched, because there's very little variation in what they know about the social structure of the case. They don't know necessarily if the person calling is rich or poor or complaining about an equal or a superior or an intimate or whatever. And so usually when police are called, they get dispatched and they arrive. It's after they arrive that you get a lot more variation in how cases are handled. For example, you have the finding that when the head of a household calls somebody, like you know the person who pays the rent, pays the mortgage, has their name on the deed or the lease, When that person calls the police to a domestic dispute, do they handle the dispute in a conciliatory manner or in a penal manner, arresting somebody? Well, it depends on the status of the other party. If the other party is also a household head, if there's somebody who also has their name on the lease or the deed or pays the rent or whatever, they tend to handle the matter in a conciliatory fashion, as you would expect between two equals. If the other party is someone of lower status, someone who is financially dependent on the one who called the cops, they tend to handle things in a more penal way and make an arrest. You also see some sociological variation in investigation. This is the sort of thing we already covered in Mark Cooney's article, Evidence as Partisanship. People say with close social ties to the police, if one of them is killed, the case gets investigated more thoroughly than if, say, a homeless vagrant is killed. The policing of vice is probably the most proactive sort of policing there is because a lot of time and effort goes into even locating the deviants. The police are often acting against voluntary conduct. That is, you know, the drug seller wants to sell drugs, the drug buyer wants to buy drugs, and so neither side's going to complain to the law about drug selling or drug buying. This is where you get things like undercover stings and buy-bust operations. In some extremes, you even get sorts of illegal law, like planting evidence to try to convict somebody of selling drugs. Worth noting that the social location that vice work tends to concentrate in is towards people who are socially marginal and unconventional. So drug stings don't tend to target your medical doctor who's quietly addicted to morphine that he prescribes himself. They tend to target people involved in a lifestyle of drugs and crime, people who live very much outside the mainstream. Juvenile justice is notable for combining a sort of leniency with a kind of severity. Juveniles are generally low status, and when they're out in public by themselves, they attract a lot of suspicion from adults and from the law. They might be harassed and chased off just for hanging around an area, not doing anything. They might be yelled at and lectured or made to do push-ups or other sorts of physical punishment. But in another sense, they're handled very leniently because they tend not to be taken to jail as much and charged as much. Instead, if they do get in trouble, they're often handed off to their parents. And Black views this as an implication of the idea that A, they're low status, but B, they're also subject to a lot of other social control. So when they're off away from the other social control, from the authority of parents and teachers, they tend to get treated harshly because they're low status. But once they're caught, they tend to be treated leniently because they're handed off to the other agents of social control. A big distinction in 
traffic law is between moving offenses, you know, offenses that happen while someone's driving the car, and parking offenses. Parking offenses, there's not a lot of variation in how they're handled. They're handled very mechanically, partly because there's not a lot of variation in the social identities of the offenders. I mean, I guess at the extremes you could tell a very rich person's car from a very poor person's car, but for the most part, a car doesn't give you that much information about whether the person driving it is the same race as you, or a friend, or a stranger, or a friend of a friend, or whatever. It's just a car. Versus in a traffic stop, you learn a lot more about the social identity of the deviant, and that's where you get a lot more variation. One of the classic kinds, of course, is that officers often and will not ticket a fellow officer or a close relative of a fellow officer. Are there certain other professions that might give a degree of immunity to traffic tickets? Uh, I had a friend who was a nurse who was once pulled over, and the officer saw her hospital badge and just quietly walked back to his car. And she actually leaned out of her window and said, hey, where are you going? Aren't you going to give me a ticket? And he said, you might save my life one day. I'm not going to give you a ticket, and drove off. So you see that kind of variation in the handling of traffic offenses more than in parking offenses. Finally, one type of legal enforcement Black gives some attention to is the policing of what he calls skid row vagrants. So homeless people, often with alcohol problems or drug problems or mental health problems, and these people have a combination of low status characteristics. They're highly unintegrated, they're also very poor, uneducated, unconventional, and widely considered deviant and disreputable. And they tend to attract a lot of penal law. And in the reading, he describes some of these extremes, including physical abuse and beating. Which is not to say that most officers do this. The point is that if there's any population that's vulnerable to this, it's skid row vagrants. Showing how people with very low status can be vulnerable to harsh penal law.